Let's then open in a word of prayer and we will begin. Father God, thank you for this time that we can meet together. We thank you for your word that you have preserved for us. We pray that you would give us insight as we open your word, that we would set aside our own opinions and traditions, and we would believe what you have written. We pray, Lord, that we would each day become more established in the truth, that we might be the ambassadors you want us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And it, and it just occurred to me, I, I've forgotten one announcement, so thanks to the Zimmermans for the wonderful backdrop here. Um, this is going to be nice. I think it's going to... There you go. Uh, it's going to be great for, for filming. It, it, I think it may help with warmth. It looks terrific, so thank you. Appreciate that. All right, our topic this morning is the parables of the kingdom. So let me uh, introduce that topic. So how do you get saved today? You get saved today by the gospel of the grace of God, and that simply is that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. You're not saved by works. You're saved in an instant when you believe the gospel, the grace of God. You don't have to join anything. You don't have to tithe. You don't have to turn over a new leaf. You're saved when you place your faith in the blood that Christ shed for you on the cross. It's that simple. It's that straightforward. It's eternal once you believe. The part of the Bible that is written to us today during the dispensation of grace is Romans through Philemon. That's the part that contains the information that is directly applicable to us. However, we can profit from reading anywhere in the Word of God, and so we study all of it. We're just careful how we apply it. What I want to begin today is we're going to look at the parables of the kingdom. And so we'll be looking at parables that the Lord taught during his earthly ministry. Now those parables are specifically related to the gospel of the kingdom. They are not related to the gospel of the grace of God, but we can nonetheless profit by studying them. So we're going to spend some time doing that. So that's an overview of, of where we're trying to go. So let's start with this. Let's start with the word parable. The word parable occurs 63 times in the scriptures, 45 of those are in the New Testament. What does the word parable mean? So if we look at the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, here's the meaning. It's from the Latin parabola. Does anyone remember what a parabola is? Right? I mean, you remember this from high school uh, trigonometry, you know. I'm sure this brings back fond memories. Um, the Latin word parabola means to throw forward or against, to compare to or against. So it's comparing one thing with another is the idea. The definition given in 1828 is a fable or allegorical relation or representation of something real in life or nature from which a moral is drawn for instruction. I'm going to read that again. It's a fable, in other words, it's a story, or allegorical relation or representation of something real in life or nature. So it's a story, but it's a story that comports with something real in nature, you know, an incident that really could have occurred, from which a moral is drawn for instruction. So you remember as a child and you would hear, what's the moral of the story? Well, a, a, a parable is a fable or a representation of something in real life. And there's a moral to it. There's a teaching to take from it. And so I would define it this way. A parable is an allegorical representation of real life from which a moral is drawn for instruction. Now get with me Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13. 
So with every parable that, that you look at or you study, you should ask yourself the question, what's the takeaway? What's the moral? What's the point of this? The, the, the parable is teaching me some moral truth. What is it? Now let me ask you a question. Why did the Lord speak in parables? What was his motivation? What was his purpose in doing that? The typical thing that is thought or taught is that the Lord taught in parables to make things easier to understand. Look with me at Matthew 13, verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? They ask the basic question, Why are you speaking in parables? Now if you notice what verse 10 said, they ask it very specifically. Why speakest thou unto them? In parables. They're saying, why are you talking to others in parables? Verse 11. He answered and said unto them. This is unto the disciples. Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So what's the Lord's answer in verse 11? In verse 10, the question is, why do you speak unto them in parables? And in verse 11, the Lord said, well, it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but it's not given unto them. Is there a difference between you and them? There is. There was some understanding that was given unto the disciples that was not given unto the them, the others. Look with me at verse 12. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables. Here's the, the answer. Because they seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. In other words, what the Lord is saying in verse 13 is they physically see, they physically hear what is being taught, but do they really see or hear or understand? They don't. So they're there capable of witnessing it, but they can't comprehend it. Verse 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. So Christ speaks in parables. So that even though those outside the disciples can see and hear, they won't be able to understand what they're seeing and hearing. In other words, he, is he teaching in parables to make the truth easier to understand? Or is he teaching in parables to make it more difficult to understand? He's actually teaching in parables so that it cannot be understood. Now that is contrary to what people say about the scriptures, but surely you've realized by now there's all kinds of things people say about the scriptures that are the exact opposite of what the scriptures say about themselves. So which should you believe? Should you believe what people say about the scriptures or should you believe what scripture says about the scriptures? And of course, we should believe what scripture says about the scriptures. Verse 15, For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, 
for they see, and your ears, for they hear. So what Matthew 13 tells us simply is this. Parables were used by the Lord. The reason he spoke in them was not to make things simpler, not to make things clearer, but so that he could speak publicly to all of humanity that was present and hide it from much of the audience. That's what he's doing, right? The disciples, he would explain things to. But when he was speaking to the masses, what did he do? He spoke in parables. And he spoke in parables so that it would not be understood. Look with me at Psalm 49. Now we've seen... We looked at the dictionary definition of what a parable is. I want to show you what Scripture says. The Bible often gives you clarity as to what terms mean. Now, that doesn't mean you you shouldn't use a dictionary that it's wrong to, but it's it's also good. Not Not only should you use a dictionary... But you should look to see how the Bible uses words because the Bible will give you clarity as to what that word, as to how that word is used in the scriptures. So you want to do both. Look at me at Psalm 49, verse 4. I will incline mine ear to a parable. I will open my dark saying upon the harp. Now, what you see in that verse is something that Scripture does often. It will often have two phrases in a row, and those phrases are very similar. And when you compare those phrases, it will tell you how to think about the terms used in those phrases. So if you look at the first phrase, it uses the word parable. What does the word parable line up with in the second phrase? What does it correspond to? It corresponds to dark saying. Look with me at Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 2. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter... Dark sayings of old. Well, if we use the same principle that we just looked at, we see there that there's two different phrases that are parallel. The the first phrase, I will open my mouth in a parable. What does the word parable correspond to in the second phrase? It corresponds to dark saying, doesn't it? Look with me at Ezekiel 17. Ezekiel 17. Ezekiel chapter 17 and verse 2. Ezekiel 17 verse 2. Son of man, put forth a riddle and speak a parable unto the house of Israel. Again, we see that parallel construction. In this case, what does the word parable correspond to? It corresponds to riddle, doesn't it? So we've looked at three different verses here, and twice the word parable corresponded to a dark saying... In Ezekiel, it corresponds to a riddle. So, scripturally, what is a parable like? Well, it's like a riddle or a dark saying. Well, is a riddle perfectly straightforward? It's not, right? The whole purpose of a riddle is there's something about it that's hidden or that's difficult to understand. If... uh, If you watch the Batman TV show, there is someone called the Riddler. 
and the Riddler has riddles, and are they easy to understand, or are they convoluted and difficult and challenging? Well, they're difficult. A dark saying. It's dark. In other words, there's something about it that's not obvious. There's something about it that is cryptic or hidden. Get with me Proverbs 26. So what we're seeing here is this. Parables, by their nature in Scripture, have something about them that's hard to understand. They are intentionally that way. Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs 26, verse 7. The legs of the lame are not equal. So is a parable in the mouth of fools. Verse 9. As a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. So what are those verses telling us? So think of the thorn in the hand of a drunkard. So what happens with the drunkard is the drunkard is drunk. And so he's uncoordinated or he stumbles. So what happens with the thorn? Goes into his hand. In other words, one of the, one of the great reasons that you have senses is that senses help you avoid pain. In other words, when you put your hand on a hot stove, what happens? You feel the heat, you, you, you feel pain as a result, and what do you do? You withdraw your hand from it. And that's, that's, that's a salutary thing, that's healthy, right? In other words, it's nice that you have senses that identify pain, right? That, that, then you avoid further damage to yourself. Another example is, I was talking with someone about this the other day, it's fascinating that God puts your nose right above your mouth. You know why, one of the reasons I think he did that? Have you ever had food where it doesn't smell right and you just know you shouldn't eat it? Well, it's, it's well designed, isn't it, right? So the nose perceives there's something here that's a problem. I'm not eating this, right? Or you have a sense of taste. Sometimes you taste something you're like, I'm not going to eat this, right? Well, what happens with the drunkard? His senses are dulled. So what happens is when he first contacts the thorn, what should he do? Well, he should draw back from it because he perceives the, the pain. But what happens is if his senses are dulled, he, he has no ability to do that, and so the thorn causes more damage. So now look at the verse, verse 9. As a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. In other words, if you're a fool, if you're unwise, if you have no understanding... You can recite a parable, you can quote it, but you won't understand its meaning, you won't understand its application because you're a fool. In other words, it's necessary to have some wisdom as to how to apply a parable. That's what that's telling us. Look with me at Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 6, starting verse 5. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation. See, a proverb has an interpretation. It's, it's not just a story, it's what does it mean, what is it teaching you? The words of the wise and their dark sayings. So again, we see a proverb likened to a dark saying. So let's recap before we move on to the next point. So parables are, and I'm just going to read the, the summary definition that we came up with, it's an allegorical representation 
of real life from which a moral is drawn for instruction. So it's an allegory or a story based upon real life from which a moral is drawn for instruction. We looked at why the Lord taught in parables and what was the reason. It was to hide things. It was to conceal it. When we looked at how Scripture describes a parable, it's described as a dark saying or a riddle. In other words, there's something about it that is cryptic or hidden. And therefore, when you study parables or teach them, you have to have some wisdom to understand what the point of the parable is. All right, so turn with me to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. And actually, get Mark chapter 4 first. Get Mark chapter 4. The first parable that we are going to look at is the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower is repeated three times in Scripture. It's found in Matthew, it's found in Mark, it's found in Luke. And it's a somewhat lengthy parable. So obviously the parable of the sower is significant if it appears three times in Scripture and so much space is devoted to it. Look with me at Matthew 4, verse 13. This is right in the middle of the telling of the parable of the sower in Mark. Verse 13, And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? In other words, don't you understand this? And then notice what he says, And how then will ye know all parables? The parable of the sower is a foundational truth under the kingdom program. If you don't grasp the parable of the sower, it will be difficult for you to grasp the meaning of the other parables. It's, it's foundational. So with that, let's go to Matthew 13. So our immediate goal this morning is to look at the parable of the sower and to understand its meaning. So we'll, we're going to look at Matthew 13, and we'll, we'll read the parable in Matthew 13. We'll then read it in Mark 4, and we'll then read it in Luke 8. So we'll look at all three tellings of the parable. Matthew 13, verse 3. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Verse 7, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, 
and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. So in verse 17, the Lord is making the point, what did many Old Testament prophets want to do? They wanted to be present during the Lord's earthly ministry, and they wanted to see and hear these things, but of course they weren't able to. Notice verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. So what the Lord is about to do is he's about to give the explanation of the parable that he told earlier. Verse 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. Verse 20. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Verse 22. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. But he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So that's the telling of the parable of the sower in Matthew. Get with me Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Mark 4 verse 2. And he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine... Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and some an hundred. Verse 9, And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. What's the Lord saying in verse 9? when he says, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. When we were in Matthew 13, it talked about the fact that there were some present, as described in Isaiah, where they had ears to hear, they had eyes to see. In other words, they could physically perceive what was happening, but could they really understand it? And they couldn't, because they didn't really have ears to hear. So what he's saying in that verse is, he that hath ears to hear, in other words, if you have the ability to understand what I'm telling you, then you need to hear it, you need to receive it. That's the idea of what he's saying in in Mark 13, excuse me, Mark 4, verse 9. Now look at verse 10. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. In other words, they're asking him, what what does it mean? Verse 11. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Verse 13, 
And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Verse 16, And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Verse 20, And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundred. Get Luke 8. Now, as we read the three tellings of the parable of the sower, you'll see that they are all similar, but they do have differences in wording. And so, what's helpful is to compare things one with another because every word of Scripture is valuable. And so, if you see things stated one way in one passage and a different way in another passage, you can learn something from the different ways that they're stated. So look with me at Luke chapter 8. We'll begin in verse 4. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it, and some fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground, and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 9. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among the thorns are they, which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. Verse 15, But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. So we see that there's four, uh, we've seen the three different tellings of the parable of the sower, and we've seen in each of those, each of those tellings How many different types of ground are there? Four, right? And the seed that is sown, what does the seed represent? The Word of God. So we have clarity about what the seed is. The seed is the Word of God. And it's sown into four different types of soils. Now what we need to understand about the soils is... The four soils produce different results and different reactions, don't they? We need to understand what is going on with each of the soils to understand how the gospel of the kingdom works. So let's start with the first soil. 
The first soil is by the wayside. Look with me at Luke chapter 8, verse 12. Luke 8, verse 12. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now here's my question. Is the soil by the wayside, are those individuals saved? They're not, right? Because the seed is sown there by the wayside, and what happens? The devil takes the seed that was sown, he snatches it away, and notice the last part of verse 12, lest they should believe and be saved. So in other words, the seed by the wayside is people that hear the gospel of the kingdom. They hear it taught. But what happens immediately? It's taken away. It's it's snatched away from them, and they have no ability to believe and be saved. So think of it this way. If you take a seed and you plant it by the wayside, so it's not even buried. It's just sitting there. What's going to happen to that seed? Well, it'll just get snatched, right? It, it'll get taken. It, it, it never has, it, it, it's a non-starter. It, it, it's never even placed in a situation where it can grow and bear fruit. So by the wayside is representative of people that hear the gospel of the kingdom. This isn't for today. They hear the gospel of the kingdom and it's immediately snatched away. They don't even have the opportunity to believe. Okay? That's the seed by the wayside. What was the second type of soil? The second type of soil was the stony places or stony ground or upon a rock. When you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, each of them phrases it a little bit differently, but the idea is it's it's stony or rocky. Look with me at Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verse 20. But he that receiveth the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. So it's not snatched away immediately, like by the wayside was. The person receives it with joy. But notice verse 21. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. So if you imagine planting a plant on a rock, what happens? Well, the roots can't grow down into the rock. So it it can't form any sort of stability. So is it going to be able to endure for very long? It's not going to. And so what happens, according to verse 21, is when tribulation or persecution ariseth, that person is offended. Look with me at Mark 4, 17. Mark chapter 4, verse 17. And have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. In other words, not very long. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Get Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 13. They on the rock are they, which when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation, fall away. So does the seed on a stony place or on a rock, does that person believe? And the answer is yes, they do. But how long do they believe? Well, according to verse 13, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation, fall away. So they believe for 
a little bit of time, but then they stop believing. Now, I want you to think with me before we go on here for a minute. Think about how the gospel of grace works today. What happens if you believe the gospel of grace? And the gospel of grace is Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. When you believe that, when you place your faith in Christ's shed blood as the payment for your sins, how long does it take from you believing that to get saved? Six, seven months? Hour and a half? Immediately, right? In other words, the moment that you have faith in the blood that Jesus Christ shed for you, you're saved, right? Happens instantaneously. Now let me ask you another question. So you believe the gospel of grace today, that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. What happens if three months later, six months later, however long, 25 years later, you decide, I don't believe that anymore. It's not true. I reject it. Are you saved or lost? You're saved because the moment you believe the gospel to begin with, during the dispensation of grace, what happened with the Holy Spirit? You were sealed. So the moment you had faith in His blood, the Holy Spirit indwelt you and sealed you, is it even possible for you to lose your salvation? It's not. That's the way it works during the dispensation of grace. But is that the way it works under the gospel of the kingdom? Obviously not, based upon the parable of the sower. Because the person could believe for a time, and then when, they were, when persecution or tribulation arose, they would be offended and stop believing. If you think about Matthew 24, 13, let's just read it together. Matthew 24, 13. Matthew 24, 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Does the gospel of the kingdom require endurance? Plainly it does, right? Isn't that what it says? But he that shall endure unto the end, in other words, if you do that, the same shall be saved. Well, what happens if you don't do that? Then you're not saved. Now again, where are we on the chart when we're talking about this? We're here under the gospel of the kingdom. We're here in early Acts. We're not here during the dispensation of grace. It works differently. But what we're seeing, the parable of the sower clearly teaches that under the kingdom program, you have to endure to be saved. The problem with the seed on a rock, if you were trying to plant something, what happens if you plant it on a rock? Well, the roots can't grow down into the rock, right? So is it, is it going to have any root? Is it going to have any way to endure over time? It might endure for a brief period of time, but it's not going to take root in any sense where it will be an enduring plant. It, it just won't be able to. Look with me at... Get uh, Matthew 18. Matthew 18, verse 6. Actually, get, get Matthew 24. I want to make a couple points here on, on Matthew 24, 13. So, Matthew 24, 13 says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Some folks try to get around the natural meaning of what that says by saying that salvation there is physical deliverance. Look with me at verse 9. 
Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Matthew 24 is a description of the 70th week. During the 70th week, our believers promised physical deliverance. Yes? No? Maybe? Not paying attention? Well, they're clearly not promised physical deliverance because what happens to many believers during the 70th week? They're martyred. So are they promised physical deliverance during the 70th week? Plainly not. And in fact, what did verse 9 just tell you? Many of them are betrayed and, and put to death. Verse 10. And then shall many be offended, that's they quit believing, and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Look at verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Are there those during the 70th week that fall away from the truth? There are. And so when it's talking about enduring unto the end, the same shall be saved, what it's plainly talking about is it's talking about the believer enduring, continuing in the faith. And if they continue in the faith, they shall be saved. Look with me at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 21. Matthew 10, verse 21. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall raise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Verse 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Well, is the saved in verse 22 physical deliverance? In verse 21, it just got done telling you that people will be put to death. The idea there is enduring unto the end. It's continuing in the faith to the point of death is the idea. Look with me at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Now while you're getting John 8, let me just make this point. Many people live in the Gospels. Some have a red letter Bible because the most important words are those in the red letters, is what they've been told. Because the ones in the red letters are what Jesus spoke, right? It's just like when you go to a restaurant and you see some things in red that are spicy. Those are the things that the Lord would order if he was eating there. Not really. Let me pause for a minute. Is, is it a true statement that the red letters are more important? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So are the red letters more important than the black letters? They're not. And in fact, the red letters are not directly written to the body of Christ today. The red letters are all true, but they were written for Israel under the kingdom program. Right? That's what they were. Today you live during the dispensation of grace. By the way, the last information that the Lord revealed was not the red letters. It was the information he revealed to the Apostle Paul. And that's the importance of, of why we need to focus on what Paul wrote, because that's the most recent revelation that the Lord has given. Look at me at John chapter 8, verse 30. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Under the kingdom program, did people have to continue in the word? 
That's the idea. So when you think of the stony ground and people don't endure, they don't continue, they're not saved. They're not his disciples. Get with me Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Many think that Hebrews was written by the Apostle Paul and that Hebrews is doctrine for today. But if you read Hebrews, you'll notice that it actually lines up with the gospel of the kingdom. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, notice, in departing from the living God. So the author writes to the brethren and warns them, don't depart. In other words, it's a risk that they they could do that. Verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ. What's the next word? If. Well, doesn't the word if tell you it's conditional? We are made partakers of Christ if, and then what do we have to do? If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. They have to do something there, don't they? They have to hold it steadfast unto what? The end. Now, that's not written to us today during the dispensation of grace. That's not the way our salvation works. But for folks under the kingdom program, did they have to hold their confidence steadfast unto the end? They plainly did. Get with me Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. Paul says something very similar to that in Romans 1. But notice what Hebrews then says here. But if any man draw back... My soul shall have no pleasure in him. Paul doesn't say that. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. That's that's bad. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. What are all these verses telling you? What these are all telling you is under the kingdom program, you have to continue in the faith. You have to endure unto the end. And if you don't do that, you're not saved under the kingdom program. So that's the second soil, that's the soil that was the, the, where the seed was upon the rock or upon the stony places. Let's talk about the thorns. Get with me Mark 4, get Matthew 13, we have a couple more things here to cover, so just endure unto the end if you would. That's, it's okay to say that, I guess, but Matthew 13, 22. He also that receiveth, received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. So he heard it, but notice what happens. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Now it doesn't say that this person stops believing. The person, the, the stony ground, that they quit believing. They, they didn't endure unto the end. They, they didn't hold the faith. Here what it says is they were unfruitful. What Mark 4, verse 19 says, Mark 4, 19, is it says, And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Luke 8, 14, let's just see that. Luke 8, 14 Luke 8, verse 14. And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So it's described twice as being unfruitful. It's described once as bringing no fruit to perfection. Now, can can anyone give me a Pauline verse? that is different than that. Or let me put it this way. Under 
the gospel of the grace of God. Is it possible to bear no fruit and still be saved? And how, how would you prove that? What, what passage tells you that? All right, let's get 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, it is better to bear fruit. It's better to build the way the Lord would have us to build. But I just want to show you a difference here. So 1 Corinthians 3.15. If any man's work shall be burned, so that, that in this passage that means that the man built with wood, hay, and stubble. In other words, he built upon the foundation of Christ, not with gold, silver, and precious stones, but wood, hay, or stubble. It was tested by fire, and it was consumed. So verse 15 If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. That's loss of reward from verse 14. But notice what it says. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. During the dispensation of grace, you can be unfruitful and still be saved. It's not recommended. It's not prudent. It's not wise. But you can. That's how the gospel of the grace of God works. That's not how the gospel of the kingdom works. Get with me Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Now as you're turning there, let me make this point. What we saw in the three tellings of the parable of the sower is the fruit that was choked by the thorns. It's the fruit. The seed that was choked by the thorns, it didn't bear fruit. So what happens? Does that seed go into the kingdom and just not receive a reward? How do we know what happens to it? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to run some cross-references to what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say about things that don't bear fruit. So look at me at Matthew 3, verse 10. Matthew 3, verse 10. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees... Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit, so this is going to be a really instructive cross-reference, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Does that sound good or bad? Bad, excellent, good job, yes, that sounds very bad. Matthew 7, verse 19. Matthew 7, verse 19. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Look with me at Luke 13. Luke 13. Luke 13. This is the parable of the fig tree. Verse 6. He spake also this parable, A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? Now interestingly in this parable it tells you that the man came to the vineyard for a specific period of time. And it tells you what it is. How long is it? Three years. What else do you know in the gospel lasts three years? Christ's earthly ministry. So now let's keep reading. Verse 8. And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Fascinating. So... The Lord comes to the vineyard. It hasn't borne fruit for three years. He says, let's cut it down. And the dresser says, what? Give it one more year. So if the three years correspond to the Lord's earthly ministry, then what's the additional year? Well, the additional year is right here. Acts 2 to 7, which lasts approximately one year. And if at the end of that year, Israel had not borne fruit, what should happen 
on the basis of Luke 13. It should be cut down, cast into the fire, which, if there is no dispensation of grace, what event should follow Acts 2 through 7? In Acts 2, when Peter stands up, he says, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel, and Joel clearly is talking about the 70th week. So if that timetable goes on forward, it's going to lead right into the 70th week. But of course, what did God choose to do with the Apostle Paul? He called a timeout in the prophetic program and introduced the dispensation of grace. All right. Look with me at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. We're getting closer. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Get John 15. John chapter 15. Fruitfulness is required under the kingdom program. John chapter 15. And let's look at verse 4. John 15 verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, so he's not going to bear fruit, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So what we see is this. The seed that is sown among thorns, what happens is the cares of this world choke it, and it becomes unfruitful. What happens to things that are unfruitful, based upon the verses we've seen in Matthew and John and Second Peter? It ends up being burned, doesn't it? That's the idea. So what is the fourth seed? The fourth seed was good ground. Look with me at Luke 8. Look at Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 and verse 15. But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. So of the four soils we looked at in the parable of the sower, how many of those soils actually correspond to saved people? One, right? Because the first one, the seed by the wayside, what happened? It says that Satan snatched it lest they believe. So the seed by the wayside never even believed. The second seed was the seed upon stony ground. What happened with that? It didn't endure. Do you have to endure under the kingdom program? You have to endure under the kingdom program. The third soil was the soil that fell among the thorns. And what happened? The thorns choked it, and it was unfruitful. Well, what happens to those that are unfruitful under the kingdom program? It says they're cut down and they're cast into fire. And then the fourth ground was what? The good ground, and it bare much fruit. So what does that tell you about the kingdom program? Here's what it tells you. Under the kingdom program, you have to do three things. The first thing is you have to believe the gospel of the kingdom. The second thing you have to do is you have to continue to believe the gospel of the kingdom. Because if you quit believing it, you fall away. The third thing you have to do is you have to bear fruit. And if you do all those things and endure under the end, under the kingdom program, 
you're then saved. Now just pause for a minute. Praise God you live during the dispensation of grace. Right? And so we'll close with this. We looked at the gospel of the kingdom. We're going to be, or the par- we looked at the parable of the sower, and we're going to continue to look at the other parables of the kingdom because there's things we can learn from them. What the parable of the sower does, I would suggest to you it's the paramount, it's the most important of the parables of the kingdom. It tells you how salvation works under the kingdom. And you have to believe, continue to believe, and you have to bear fruit. You live during the dispensation of grace, and the gospel works differently today. The way that the gospel works today, Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. And you're saved by grace through faith in a moment of time when you believe the gospel. When you trust the blood that Jesus Christ shed for you, you are saved in that instant forever, even if you change your mind about the gospel, even if you live a life of wickedness, even if you never bear fruit. Now, I'm not encouraging you to make those decisions because those are self-destructive decisions, but it tells you something about the hugeness of God's grace that what happens is you can believe in an instant be sealed by the Holy Spirit of that, at that moment, and the Holy Spirit will seal you unto the day of redemption. You have a salvation that is certain and secure and cannot be lost. Hallelujah. So let's be grateful for that, and then, guess what? That's the message the world needs to hear, right? Th- th- that is the answer... As you look around, and this is, this, is, this is no secret, what's happened during all the lockdown stuff? All the lockdown stuff, people have less social contact. They're more isolated. They're more depressed. They spend more time abusing substances. All those things are factual. None of that is alarmism. That's just reality, right? They feel alienated. They feel alone. They're turning to substances. They're very troubled. Well, what's the answer? Well, the real answer is not vaccine. The real answer is the gospel of the grace of God, which will solve the eternal spiritual problem that people have. And as the body of Christ, that's the message we need to be giving people. That's that's the answer. Amen? Father God, thank you for the saints. We thank you for won their salvation. And we thank you, Lord, also for their interest in the truth. We just pray that each day we would be better ambassadors to preach the gospel of grace, that people might believe it and be saved. We give you all the glory in all things. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll... uh...